Good evening, and welcome to the Betty and Schmuel Rosencrantz oration on this special night. Special, extra special for two reasons. It's the 80th anniversary, a few days ago, of a terrible night in Jewish history, the night of the November pogroms, which became known as Reichskristallnacht, or simply Kristallnacht. And also, as you'd be aware, it's the 100-year anniversary today of the end of World War I, which is significant to the Holocaust because, as we know, when World War I ended, this kind of start was the beginning, marked the beginning of the events that led to World War II, lest we forget. My name is Jane Josem, and I speak to you today in my capacity as Acting Director of the Jewish Holocaust Centre. I wish to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Special welcome to all the Holocaust survivors with us. Welcome to Mr Leon Goldman and members of the Rosencrantz, Goldman and Lazarus families. Thank you kindly for your ongoing support of this annual oration. I would also like to welcome the following dignitaries and community leaders who are among us. We have Rabbi Philip Heilbrunn, who's the president of the Rabbinical Council of Victoria, and Rabbi Fred Morgan, Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Beth Israel, and Rabbi Aviva Kippen. Mr. Cedric Geffen, co-president of March of the Living, Mrs. Hetty Goldberg, Honorary Consul of Botswana, Councillor Dick Gross, Deputy Mayor of the City of Port Phillip, Councillor Jamie Hyams, the new Mayor of the City of Glenira, Mr. Miroslav Miletic, Vice Consul of the Republic of Croatia, and Mr. Joseph Petrik, Consul General of the Republic of Croatia, Councillor Marcus Pearl, Councillor of the City of Port Phillip, Mr. Antonio Scarati, the Consular Officer of the Consul General of Italy, Councillor Joel Silva, Deputy Mayor of the City of Glenira, and Mr. Michael Pierce, Honorary Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, and Anton Herman, Vice President of the JCCV, the Jewish Community Council, and Gennady Vilkov, President of the Russian Jewish Community. And someone didn't switch their phone off. And welcome to our co-presidents, Pauline Rockman, OAM, and Sue Hample, OAM, Helen Mayamoff, the chair of the JHC Foundation, and all members of the board of the JHC. Last but not least, special welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Michael Berenbaum, and his wife, Melissa, who've joined us from America. It's wonderful to have Michael with us, as he's not only an expert on the Holocaust, but additionally an expert on Holocaust museums, having worked with so many. Welcome to Australia, and I look forward to discussing our museum plans in more depth with you in the coming days. And welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, joining us for this special oration. As many of you know, we deliberately hold this oration as close as possible to the Kristallnacht anniversary because it was this event which shaped the life of the late Schmuel Rosencrantz in so many ways. He was fortunate to survive the pogrom and made his, his way to Australia. But in his new homeland, he never rested on his laurels. The events of that night burnt inside him and he thereafter committed his life to the Jewish community. Schmuel Rosencrantz was a doyen of our community, active in so many circles at the highest level. Not only was he president of the Jewish Holocaust Centre, but he was a long-serving president of Elwood Shul, and he presided over what is today known as the Jewish Community Council of Victoria, the State Zionist Council, and was a member of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. And there were many other fields in which he contributed. Schmuel was also involved for many years in the Council to Combat Anti-Semitism and Fascism and with Melbourne's Bialik College. And notably, he was a founder of the Habonim Youth Movement in Australia almost seven decades ago. 
In his role as president of the Holocaust Centre, a position he held for 14 years, he guided and led the centre to what has become today the focal point in Australia of Holocaust education, memorialisation, survivor testimonies and more. In 2015, Schmuel was appointed the centre's inaugural life governor, an accolade that was richly reserved. Schmuel is remembered as a great leader, a wise and learned man, and a wonderful orator. So many of us can remember the power and wisdom of his words, whether they were shouted or whispered from a stage, or simply in the course of conversation. He also gave say he he also he always gave sage and considered advice, and I certainly was fortunate to have benefited benefited from his great counsel. And behind every great man is an even greater woman, and this annual oration, which commenced in 2008, grew out of Schmuel's desire to honour his beloved Betty. I will leave it to the family to talk more about Schmuel and Betty. We're grateful to have Schmuel's granddaughter, Terry Lazarus, addressing us shortly. Tonight we'll commence with a special presentation put together by our audiovisual producer, Robbie Simons, which takes you through the events of Kristallnacht, as it was experienced by Schmuel and his family. But before we screen the film, I just wanted to say that this year has been a challenging year for all of us who have a strong connection to the events of the Holocaust. We continue to be concerned about the implications and ramifications of the Holocaust Bill in Poland introduced earlier this year. Documentation and testimonies from Holocaust survivors in our own archive attest to anti-Semitic acts committed by Polish people before, during and after the Holocaust. Any attempts by the Polish government to distort and revise history and limit academic freedom to publish and present facts is extremely problematic. We stood this year with our federal parliament in condemning, in condemning Senator Fraser Anning's maiden speech with its racist overtones. The use of the term final solution when calling for a ban on Muslim immigration was not just offensive to Muslim and Jewish people. The substance of his speech was offensive to all Australians. Senator Anning needs to learn that the Holocaust began with words. And on the subject of words and the harm they cause, cause we, join with leading Holocaust, we joined with leading Holocaust museums around the world in response to Mark Zuckerberg's refusal to stop Holocaust deniers using the Facebook platform to spread their hate. Despite the Holocaust heavyweights that we stood side by side with in this protest, we have yet to make any inroads, which is a crying shame. And then two weeks ago, the gunning down of 11 Jewish people in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. And as this is the first event the Jewish Holocaust Center has held since that tragedy, when I finish speaking, I'm gonna ask you to stand up for a minute silence before we screen the film about Shmuel. I believe Shmuel would have agreed with this gesture. And I want us to all think about the Jewish doctors and nurses who treated the gunmen, in particular the nurse, Ari Muller, who had the immense courage to show empathy when Robert Bowers was in his care, and who believes in the power of love and humanity to overcome evil. And to also think about the Muslims who set up a campaign and raised 110,000 US dollars in a couple of days for the families of the victims. And further to this, and close to home, the tragic events in Burke Street last Friday evening. Let us also pay our respects to the much revered co-owner of Pellegrini's, Sisto Malaspino, who was randomly stabbed to death in a terror attack in the middle of our own city. This is an attack on Melbourne's heart, for Pellegrini's was a Melbourne institution that celebrated all that is great about our wonderful multicultural city and it, how random that he was the victim. So the message of Kristallnacht is that we must not ignore the warning signs, but yet the warning signs are all around us. We need to be alert, but not alarmed. We need to continue to speak out and to educate, for education is the key. 
Hatred thrives on ignorance. Or as the filmmaker Michael Moore described it, ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to hate. We do everything we can week in, week out at the Jewish Holocaust Centre, educating the next generation about the consequences of prejudice and hate and indifference. I've been working at the Jewish Holocaust Centre now for 17 years and sadly, we've become more relevant than ever. So please stand with me and focus not on hate but on the power of education, love and compassion as we unite with the families of the victims. Thank you. Thank you. There was always the knowledge in the family that my brother Shmuel was wise beyond his years. And you probably know a lot of the things that he's done for the good of the community here in Melbourne. So I won't reiterate that, but I will say that in the dark days of 1938, when he was just a little over 16, he tried to help with connections to the Youth and Hechalutz Department and other means to try and save an uncle of ours who was taken to Dachau. When he came to Australia, he was still concerned with saving Jews and he participated in the efforts of Dr. Steinberg to bring Jews to the Kimberley in Western Australia. But I think uh, his heart and soul were very much in the establishment and in the working of the Holocaust Centre. And through all his activities, he had the support of his good wife, Betty Zichrona Livracha. And um, I think he was very proud of the fact that the Holocaust Center um, had visitors, school children, hundreds of them, all during the years. And he saw that as a very important aspect of the work of the Holocaust Center, which of course it is. Above all, I will say that he's a compassionate, caring human being not only to his family or friends, but generally to any human being. It was mentioned that I was born and lived in Vienna. I recollect that Friday night when my late father, Rafa Shalom, was taken by the Gestapo away on Friday night on the eve of my brother's commencement. Naturally, I took my brother to show, but it was, it is called in the family, the commencement that never was. I remember the day when my late mother was taken by some SS men to scrap the anti-Nazi slogans from the footpath and she had to dip her hands into caustic soda 
until the dying day. Those hands were burnt and she couldn't use them properly. But also, let me turn to the actual Christina. And again, faith can do all sorts of things. And we had an acquaintance who was a prominent Nazi. And on the 8th of November 1938, this Nazi, his name was Mr. Jungwirt, he was only a little tailor, came up and said to my mother in German, naturally, make sure that Max and Emil disappear tomorrow. Max was my late father's name. Emil was my name. Make sure that they disappear. And we followed his advice. And somehow, those of you who may have been in Vienna, or may have lived in Vienna, will realize that the Vienna woods are only a few minutes away by tram or bus. And my late father and I, we walked into these woods on the 9th of November, 1938. And as we walked along, we noticed a little milk bar. In German, it was called a milk molkerei. And we walked in there and we sat. And my father ordered his coffee. And I was only permitted cocoa. And then, as dusk settled, the owner of the milk bar came along and said, uh, I'm sorry, but I have to switch the lights on. And said, you can stay here. I was shaking like a leaf. My father grabbed my hand and I grabbed his. And we were sitting there and wondering, will this man report us to the police? Will my father be taken away again? But no, he didn't. We sat, and as night fell, the skies of Vienna, the skies of Vienna were filled with flames, flames of synagogues, flames of an old age home, Flames even of a cemetery, an old cemetery in the Seegasse of Vienna. And I can tell you, those moments are unforgettable. But as we walked down the following morning, the streets were through with glass, from broken windows, from apartment blocks, and I hate to quote figures, but some 30,000 Jews throughout Austria and Germany were rounded up that night and put into concentration camps of Dachau, Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen. What happened to Julie on that fateful day of the 9th and 10th of November 1938? 
It was a pro proclamation of a death sentence for European Jews. It was the beginning of the Holocaust. It was the beginning of six million who perished. There is a Hebrew word which says everything and says a lot. Zafar, remember. First and foremost, on behalf of the Rosencrantz, Goldman and Lazarus families, I wanted to thank Michael Cohen and the team at the Holocaust Centre for organising this evening's proceedings. The Betty and Schmuel Rosencrantz oration is an amazing opportunity for us all to come together and share in the legacy of my grandparents. I think, as Jane mentioned, it is especially fitting that we are here today, not only to remember Kristallnacht and the Holocaust, but also on the 11th of November, International Remembrance Day, exactly 100 years following the end of the First World War, not to mention in the wake of the devastating events that took place in the CBD on Friday afternoon. Evenings like this are even more important. We have heard over the years the story of Kristallnacht and from Zeta himself, um, the night of the broken glass that took place on the evening of the 9th of November, 1938. And I feel like we do need to mention the events of that night. So the attacks began as retaliation for the assassination of Ernst von Rath and ended with Jewish homes, hospitals and schools being ransacked. Over 7,000 businesses destroyed or damaged and more than 250 synagogues decimated. Kristallnacht changed the nature of Nazi persecution of the Jews from economic, political and social to physical with beatings, incarceration and murder. As you would all know and have just heard, my grandfather at the tender age of 16 saw this with his own innocent eyes and it changed him forever. On arriving in Australia the following year, Zeta went straight to work as a 17-year-old in order to ensure that his family had sufficient means through these difficult times and that his younger siblings, Paul and Annie, were able to complete their education. This is where his family and community-focused life really began. I feel that at this young age, whilst watching the horrors of the Holocaust take place in Europe, a spark was ignited within him to support and continue and ensure the growth of the Jewish community. He was inspired and motivated by the likes of William Cooper and those who stood up to hatred and saw that change was possible. Whilst he knew there was nothing he could have done to stop the atrocities, he developed a strong sense of responsibility towards the future. His involvement in the Jewish community in Melbourne is widely known and recognised as something truly special. He with the help of my grandmother, Betty, led and guided countless organisations in order to encourage, nurture and grow Judaism and the Jewish way of life here in Australia. But nothing held more importance to him than his work with the Holocaust Centre. His passion, his legacy and what has all brought us here tonight at its heart is education. Zeta believed that by educating us all, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, of what the Jewish people went through is what paves the way for change to be made. And in the sometimes frightening world that we live in today, there is nothing more important than that. It has now been just over two years since Zeta passed away. And the more that time passes, the more I feel I understand his purpose that much better. He knew that the generation that witnessed the horrors of the Holocaust are slowly leaving us. And it is about educating and encouraging the current and future generations to feel the passion and love for the community and our shared history that he felt. We are here now and it is our responsibility to share their stories, to remember their experiences, to never forget and to pass it on for the future forever. Hi, I'm Sue Hampel, co-president of the Holocaust Centre. Um, it is with absolute pleasure that I welcome Michael and his wife Melissa to Melbourne. They arrived from Los Angeles very early this morning and Michael, I hope you're not too jet lagged. Where do I start to tell you about our keynote speaker? If I told you about all the Holocaust articles, books, lectures, documentaries, films, organisations and museums that Michael has been involved with, we would be here all evening. 
So here are just some of his career highlights. Dr. Michael Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher who consults in the conceptual development of museums and historical films. He is currently director of the Siggy Zierling Institute, which was formerly the University of Judaism, where he is also a professor of Jewish studies. Prior to his association with the American Jewish University, Michael served as president of the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which actually brought him to Australia for the very first time in 1999. Michael was the director of the United States Research Institute at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. From, and from 1988 until 1993, he served as project director of the museum and oversaw its creation. Michael has held the position of director of the Jewish Community Council of Greater Washington. He was the opinion page editor of the Washington Jewish Week, deputy director of the President's Commission on the Holocaust, where he authored the report to the president. Dr. Berenbaum was the conceptual developer on the Illinois Holocaust Museum that recently opened in Skokie, Chicago, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, as well as museums in Cincinnati and Brooklyn. Michael has conduct, consulted and or curated and developed museums across the globe, including Belgets in Poland, the Tolerance Museum in Mexico City, and he is currently working on the Memorial Museum of Macedonian Jewry. Now that's not all. <laughs> in his spare time, Michael was the author and editor of 22 books, scores of scholarly articles, hundreds of journalistic pieces which have won him several awards. And over the past decade, he was historical consultant for dozens of Holocaust films, including Conspiracy, Uprising and Defiance, and documentaries such as The Last Days and One Survivor Remembers, both of which won Academy Awards. Michael, we are so honoured that you have travelled all the way here to Australia to deliver tonight's keynote address at the annual Betty and Shmuel Rosencrantz Oration. We look forward to hearing your talk on shifting narratives of the Holocaust in contemporary society. Thank you, Sue, for an overly kind introduction. I'm going to uh, begin with a family story. Um, the first award I ever received was something called the Silver Angel Award. And you have a problem when you visit the, when you get the Silver Angel Award, the problem is who can you tell? I had teenage kids at that point. My kids thought I was the devil incarnate. My wife asked me to put the cap on the toothpaste and to make sure to lift the seat before I went to the men's room. So I did the only honorable thing a man can do, which is I called my mother. <laughs> and my mother said, I know you're an angel, now try being like a mensch. So whenever I get an introduction like that, I have to remember that my mother said, try being a mensch. Let me talk very seriously. This is the first opportunity I've had to, actually the second opportunity, no, believe it or not, it's the third opportunity I've now had to speak in the aftermath of what happened in Pittsburgh. And I think it's important to report to you before I speak about what I wanted to speak about, a little bit about what happened in Pittsburgh and what it means for the Jewish people. You're not going to be pleased because this is not something that's designed to please you. It's designed to inform you. A word about where we are in the United States, uh, and this is in keeping with the old Yiddish phrase, before I begin to speak, let me say a few words. We have to understand that we're in a unique situation today, which is Jews see, are seen by others in a way that they do not see themselves. And that is, Jews are seen by others in the United States as a privileged part of the white majority. And Israel itself is seen in a way that it does not see itself. It's seen as a regional military superpower and as a modern, America, as a modern economic miracle. 
Every Jew I know sees themselves as a minority, but it's the fact that we're a majority and the privileged part of the white majority that sets some of the boundaries with regard to anti-Semitism, and also the perception of Israel not as victim but as oppressor that sets another context for it as well. If you ask every Jew in the United States, or perhaps even in the world, is anti-Semitism on the increase, they will all raise their hands and say yes. If you look at the empirical evidence as to whether anti-Semitism is on the increase, and you ask the following questions, are greater percentages of the population anti-Semitic now than they were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, or 60 years ago? The answer is no. If you even look, ADL has done a longitudinal study of anti-Semitism in the United States. And their problem is that some of the methodology that they use for a longitudinal study asking the same questions for 50 and 60 years sounds very differently in 2016 when they did the study than it did in 1956 or 66 or 76. Example, if you ask, do Jews have un in undue influence in the American economy? In 2016, you were dealing with the chairman of the Federal Reserve was Jewish, the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve was an Israeli. The head of the Council of Economic Advisors was Jewish, and the Secretary of Treasury was not only Jewish, but an Orthodox Jew to boot. The predecessor of the Federal Reserve was a man by the name of Shalom Ben Bernanke, and his, his vice chairman was also Jewish, and their predecessors were also Jewish. And you have to ask yourself the question, and now the heads of the major banks in the United States are all Jewish because the glass ceiling has ended. So you have to ask yourself the question, is saying Jews have undue influence in the American economy an anti-Semitic statement or a factual statement? And you have to understand that very well. There was a great student of anti-Semitism in America by the name of Earl Rabb who said that the reason there is this disconnect, this disconnect between the perception of Jews and the reality of Jews perceiving anti-Semitism is on the rise, is because the expression and the, pers and the permissibility of the expression of hatred is now on the increase, and the restraint on the expression of hatred is on the decrease. If you hated 30 years ago, it was impolite to make a racist statement, or most especially an anti-Semitic statement, precisely because the Holocaust had provided a certain sense of disdain for anti-Semitism in general. But the reality is that we now have no restraint on the expression of hatred. And in the United States, you not only that, have that, but you have a combination of three other factors. One is polarization itself. The second is amplification of hatred by the internet and the community of hatred that is created by social media. And, and then we have a new phenomenon, which is the expressions of code words by the president are regarded as license by an extreme element in the United States to express hatred in a variety of ways. The bizarre news for Jews is we are not the primary target. There are four or five groups ahead of us, but that doesn't mean we are not a target. 
Let me talk for a moment about good news from Pittsburgh. The first is, comes from the idea that in the United States we have a concept of hate crime. And hate crime is very important because when you speak of hate crime, it is an attack on the society in total. And because you regard it as an attack on the society in total, it allows those who are opposed to hate to come together. So what's the good news of Pittsburgh? The good news of Pittsburgh is that civil society held together. The mayor was there immediately saying, this does not represent Pittsburgh. We don't want haters among us. District attorney said we will use all the instrumentalities of law to bring this person to the perpetrator to justice. The police went in to save the Jews. They paid for it with their life. That's radically different, for example, than Kristallnacht, than the Reichspogram, in which the police stood by to, uh, the firemen were instructed, don't put out the fire in the synagogue, just make sure the adjacent buildings don't catch fire. Explicit instructions given by telegram. So what were the only synagogues left standing in Germany were the synagogues what? that were part of larger complexes where you couldn't allow them to catch fire because homes and businesses by non-Jews would then catch fire. You also had the solidarity of the community. Imagine the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Penguins put a Jewish star on their uniform before they played the next game. The World Series paused for a moment of silence for 11 Jews. A hundred members of the Pittsburgh Steelers, including the owners and the coach, came to the funeral of the first two Jews who were to be buried because their sister had once been part of the team. She had been part of community outreach. So what you had there was you had essentially, and the most important, Absolutely the most important thing that happened was that the Muslim community contributed not 125000 but by now $250,000 toward the Tree of Life, the Eitz Chaim Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to help the people and to rebuild the synagogue. Now that says that we may be developing in the United States, if not a moderate Muslim community, then a Muslim community that has learned the rules of participation in American life. And the rules of participation in American life means that interreligious life, freedom of religion is an absolute. From 1790 onward, George Washington wrote a letter to the Newport congregation. He said, happily, the, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. And that has been the standard, and interreligious life means, in essence, that religious life has to be protected and synagogues were respected as a house of God. That, and by the way, they were respected by the house of God, but some of the polarization in the Jewish community itself had that a little bit questioned. We had a particular problem. Our president is incapable of bringing the community together with words. Similar circumstances, you had Ronald Reagan, and I'm being bipartisan, who was able to bring the community together after the Challenger disaster. George W. Bush, who was able to bring the community together after 911, and who was able to go to a Muslim mosque and speak of religious tolerance as the essence of America. Bill Clinton, who was able to speak after the attack in Oklahoma City, 
in April 19th. April 19th, ironically, was the day before Hitler's birthday, and it had a link to the fascination with the ultra-right with Nazism, and Barack Obama, who was able to do it again and again and again, because we have a terrible problem of gun violence in the United States. And he did it with Sandy Hook when they murdered children. He did it in, Charles, in, in, uh, in uh, Charlotte when they entered a black church. And only two days before the attack in Pittsburgh, a man murdered in Kentucky murdered two African Americans in a parking lot because somehow he felt his entry into a black church was barred. We live in a world, and we in America are pained by it, grieved by it, ashamed of it. We live in a world in which if you feel hatred, you feel empowered to express that hatred. And you don't feel the disrespect when you express that hatred. And that means essentially that those of us who are against hatred, who are on the side of what? Or on the side of the people who want civility, decency, pluralism, and tolerance, and infinite respect for the humanity of all of God's creation, have to come together to oppose that. That's the report we have. That's what makes our work in Holocaust education so important. And that's why what Jane said is all important. You've given me a beautiful introduction. I've created institutions that have drawn together hundreds of, uh, in excess of 100 million people. Holocaust Museum itself has drawn 50 million visitors in the 26, 27 years that it's been in existence. My dream is that we should be irrelevant. That somebody should visit a Holocaust Museum and say, look how idiotic 20th century people were. We couldn't do something like this. But we used to say never again, and now we have to grapple with the problem of we're not irrelevant, we are frighteningly relevant. And when we deal, for example, with opposition to Kristallnacht, in America the opposition to the Reichspogrom of 1938 was 97%. the willingness to take refugees in the aftermath of that increased by 3%. We hate what they're doing, but we don't want them here. Problem of immigration, they're gonna take American jobs. We have proof of it. The aftermath of Kristallnacht, England accepted 10,000 Jewish children. Now I want you to think of this for a moment. What would it take for a parent to give away their child, to send them into the arms of strangers? What it took was knowing that A, you loved your child, but you could not protect your child and the situation was going to get so bad that you had to give your child away in order to save their life. For most of us, imagining that breaks our heart. It's almost inconceivable. An effort to bring 20,000 Jewish children to the United States in something called the Wagner-Rogers Bill didn't even get out of committees on Congress. Those children would grow up, we were told, and take American jobs, and we have a sense of deja vu all over again.
So those of us who are involved in Holocaust education want to dream of a day when we are irrelevant, when anti-Semitism is not the longest hatred, but a hatred that was long and resolved. And by the way, if you think of it, we have incredible moments. Imagine if somebody had told you, I, I was with a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church who said the following, the first time in 1987 that the Bishop of Rome went to a synagogue in 1987 years since Jesus was in 1987. He said, since then, every Bishop of Rome, meaning every Pope has gone to a synagogue and every Pope will here too go to a synagogue. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church faced its past and at least on this issue transformed its teaching. Okay. So much for the precursor, but no American can speak to an audience as informed and as serious as you are without touching on these issues today. Let me now talk a little bit about the changing narrative. Three initial points. The first is we all know that we are in a transitional moment. We are moving from living history to historical memory. We'll be blessed to have survivors with us for five more years, for 10 more years. We will not have survivors with us for 20 more years. And after survivors are gone, it is now the legacy of the people who have become the witnesses to the witnesses to presume that work and to assume that work. And consequently, we are at that moment, we are one minute to midnight and the clock is ticking. Two pieces of good news on that. The first is that we have an incredible collection now, more oral and visual history of survivors of the Holocaust than any event in human history. And we have probably about 80,000 80, different interviews that have been gathered. So we will be hearing from Holocaust survivors for generations. And think of its importance in the following way. In America, we only have 36 oral histories of people who were once slaves. But think what it would be like to sit at your table on Pesach and be able to hear of someone who was a slave in Egypt and who went forth to the Promised Land. Think what it would be like not to have an, a tradition that is a verbal tradition that has come down or a written tradition that has come down, but to actually meet people who were there. And that's what we have for the future but something major is going to be lost. The moral authority, the countervailing thing that imposes a tremendous responsibility on the institutions, which are now the heirs to memory, and the institutions have to welcome that, have to embrace that, and have to see themselves as responsible for that. And that's a tension that we have in every society because we can't have the, bureaucrat, the bureaucratization of memory. We have to have the embrace of it with all of its moral authority. Point one. Let's talk a little bit about where Holocaust scholarship is. Because the reality is that Holocaust scholarship is transforming the narrative as we begin to, as we think. Let's touch on several areas. There was, uh, there is a major Holocaust scholar, a major scholar of actually of what we call the Badlands, which are Eastern European society, a fellow by the name of Timothy Snyder 
Timothy Snyder has written a very important book called Black Earth. And what he wrote about essentially is he has a context for the Holocaust, and Timothy Snyder is a non-Jew, context for the Holocaust that sets Hitler's agenda. Hitler's agenda was twofold. Hitler's agenda was number one, Lebensraum, living space. And secondly, it was a racial agenda to eliminate those who were in, to dominate those who were inferior and to eliminate one group of people whom he regarded as a cancer on German society. And I use the word cancer deliberately and specifically. And they were the Jews. Snyder says, why did Hitler oppose, and Lebensraum essentially was essentially to give Germany the context that Australia enjoys, that the United States enjoys. We speak of the United States as from sea to shining sea. In Australia, you have a vast land, a vast territory, and you can provide for yourself in an extraordinary way. We're at the 100th anniversary of World War I. World War I was essentially lost by Germany, not on the field uh, of battle, but on the field of home because it ran out of essentials. Rubber, gas, and a four-letter word. The first begins with an F, but the last are all important. F-O-O-D. And they were on the verge of starvation. Why did he want to conquer the East? Because he wanted the fertile lands, most specifically of the Ukraine. Why the Jews? Hitler lived in a world of total domination in which the powerful were to dominate, and if they were to compromise with the weak, they would be, they would be weakened. It was Darwin's survival of the fittest, and we nasty, vicious, miserable Jews taught two values that were antithetical to that survival and that were deliberately anti-Hitlerian. Anti-survival of the fittest, we taught number one, compassion, and number two, justice. Domination cannot work with the notion of compassion. And domination cannot succeed with the notion of justice. So here is a non-Jew looking objectively at it who said that Hitler opposed the Jews precisely because he was opposing their worldview that introduced a concept into the world of compassion and justice. And he couldn't attack the Christians frontally, but he would have do that indirectly by going through the back door and attacking and eliminating the Jews. Because domination cannot work if you have justice and compassion. And consequently, anti-Semitism plays a major role. He taught something that is making all of Europe deeply uncomfortable. Let's go back for a moment. You've all been heard about the boogeyman of Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial essentially had two major attacks against Holocaust denial in the year 2000 and then in uh, most recent years. The first is the defeat of David Irving. And I'm a friend of Deborah Lipstadt's, but I never speak of Deborah Lipstadt's triumph. I speak of David Irving's defeat. Not important that Deborah Lipstadt won, all important that, they, that David Irving lost. And Holocaust denial after David Irving lost. And why did David Irving lose? He lost essentially because of the fact that he was beat by his own research. Richard Evans in investigated every footnote of everything that David Irving wrote. He went back to the original documents and he showed that David Irving misquoted the original documents. And when he did, he misinterpreted them to exonerate Hitler and to approve of the agenda. 
Robert Jan von Pelt essentially showed the nature of the pseudo-scientific attack on Holocaust denial and showed the architecture of Auschwitz in all of its fullness. And in fact, this is where the movie denial misrepresented what had happened. And he showed the nature of the killing and the way in which it happened. And we have essentially resolved any of the academic issues that had been the undergirding of pseudo-scholarship of Holocaust denial. The second thing that happened is that um, we live, let me explain it to you this way. The president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, was telling the president of Germany, you don't know German history, you didn't do anything. Think of the Meshiga nature of the world in which we live in when the president of Germany says, we committed this, we have to face our past and we have to do better in the future. And Ahmadinejad says to him, what did you commit? Who should know German history? The president of Germany, the chancellor of Germany. And in fact, Ahmadinejad didn't even know the history of his own people because Iran was a way station of rescuing Jews during the Shoah. And its record was one of nobility. And whenever I spoke about this, I kept saying, I can write a wonderful history of the decency of Iran, and he's trying to tell, in the wake of German atrocity, if I were trying to indict the West, I would say, look what you did as compared to what we did. But the reality is that with the combination of the defeat of David Irving and the passing of, um, of um, Ahmadinejad from the scene, Holocaust denial lost two of its noisiest makers. What is happening now is not Holocaust denial, but something much more different, which is a rewriting of the Holocaust. And we're going to see the clash between brilliant scholarship and right-wing governments that are trying to rewrite it. Jane mentioned the Polish government. And the Polish government made it first a criminal offense and then made it a civil offense, but deceivingly, and because the Israelis went along with it, which is absolutely tragic and foolish, deceivingly, they even took away the exception for artistic representation and for academic scholarship. And what can't you say? You can't say or speak ill of the Polish institutions. And you can't speak ill of the Polish government or the Polish people. And the reality is we now know much more about what happened in Poland and the narrative itself has changed. Timothy Snyder comes along and he speaks about what he calls double occupation and double collaboration. Let me explain these two historical concepts to you. There were territories that were occupied first by the Soviet Union and after June 1941 by Germany. These territories included Eastern Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And what Snyder has shown is that in the areas of double collaboration, uh, of double occupation, there also was double collaboration. Groups that collaborated with the Soviet Union and then in order to protect themselves, in order to cleanse themselves, collaborated with Nazi Germany and did the dirty work for Nazi Germany of killing its Jews. So in, Lat in, Lat in Estonia, no Jew was killed by a German. All Jews were killed by Estonians. In Lithuania, two out of three Jews were killed by Lithuanian nationalist groups, and only one third had to be killed by Einsatzgruppen because the nationalist groups were promised what? They were promised that they might get independence if they collaborated with the Germans, and they did that by killing the Jews for them. In Latvia, the same type of phenomenon, and what do we have today? We have right-wing governments that want to reassert their own nationalism. 
And by doing so, they begin to deny their own history. And they deny their own participation in the murders. And they then put themselves in a very difficult situation because they, in essence, have to, as it were, revamp all that they're writing and in certain countries even rewrite their institutions. So in Lithuania, they are erecting statues to people who were guilty of murdering Jews. And in Hungary, and let's explain Hungary to you for one second. Hungary is the easiest of the, of the evolution of the murder of the Jews to explain. March 19th, Hungary was invaded by Germany. In April and May, the Jews were ghettoized. Between the 15th of May and the 7th of July, 437,402 Jews were shipped on 147 trains to Auschwitz. And essentially, the killing, that meant that there were 2.7 trains a day with 2,975 Jews per train. And if you look at the railroad lines in Auschwitz itself, what happens? You have one railroad track that enters Auschwitz, uh, enters Birkenau. It splits into three. That was installed in 1944. Why was it to split into three? It was to split into three because they understood that the only way to kill Hungarian Jews is if you could send three trains a day. Some of you have seen the March of the Living. Let me tell you what my first experience on the March of the Living was. When the March of the Living has Jews marching into Auschwitz, we have 12,000 Jews marching into Auschwitz on Yom HaShoah. And if you stand there, you have to look back. Vast, vast number of people. And I scratched my head and I said, that's the number of Jews who were killed every day during the summer of 1944. Astounding. It takes a Herculean effort of what? Of organization to kill these Jews. And it takes a, to bring these Jews to Auschwitz, to Auschwitz, to bring our students to Auschwitz, takes a Herculean organization, a global organization. And that was one day. Then Hungary, after July 7th, is a battle between the murderers and the rescuers. But then in the fall of 1944, the Hungarian Iron Guard takes hold, and they start slaughtering the Jews for the Germans. And if you go to Hungary, you have the empty boots on the Danube River. And you know why you have the empty boots? Because these Hungarian murderers would gather the Jews, would rope them together, and would shoot every other one so that they would drown in the Danube, which turned red. And they didn't want to waste the bullets to kill everyone, so they only killed every other one. And now if you go into Hungary and you look at the institutions, the institutions cannot tell that history, and therefore the Jewish community has to withdraw from that history. So the question of the narrative is the question between good scholarship, which is flourishing, and governmental efforts to rewrite their history. Let's talk about the things we couldn't talk about for a long time. There's a new book out a couple of years old. The new book is on it's called Holocaust Humor, It Kept Us Alive. You couldn't talk for a very long time about how Jews grappled with their own situation. One of the ways Jews grappled with their own situation was something that you couldn't talk about called humor. And I have to tell you that I've been collecting Holocaust humor for about 30 years ever since I found myself laughing when I was reading a memoir, when I was reading actually a diary. And I said, I'm not the worst person in the world. I study the worst person in the world. So if I'm laughing, 
there must be something there. And I realized that Chaim Kaplan used humor in order to get you to be able to read, in order for himself to read it. So a woman wrote about the way in which Jews used humor. Let me tell you four Holocaust jokes, but they're not funny. They are deeply funny, but they're not funny. Because humor is a way in which you can grapple with oppression. Four Jews are standing on a street corner. One says, oi. The other says, oi, oi. Third says, oi, vezmir. Fourth guy says, if we're going to talk politics all day, I'm leaving. Right? It's true. It's funny. A second example. Two Jews are reading two different newspapers. One is reading a newspaper and crying, the other is reading a newspaper and laughing. One guy looks over at the other and says, realizes the guy's laughing, he says, how can you read that garbage? He's reading their Sturmer. And he's shocked by the reaction. The guy turns to him and says, how can you read that garbage? He's reading the Jewish newspaper. He says, can you ask me, how can I read that? He says, look, you read the Jewish newspaper. You see the situation is terrible. It's getting worse. It's miserable. It's horrible. I read their summer. I realize that Roosevelt is not Roosevelt. He's Rosenfeld, that we have all of this power that we control the world, why would I read your newspaper when I can read my newspaper? And part of that is to, again, grapple with it. The third is my favorite, which is a young boy's asked in the Warsaw Ghetto, what would you like most of all if you were Hitler's son? And the Yiddish is more beautiful, I'd like to be an orphan. And I give you an hour, and you can th if you can think of a better answer, I don't know of a better one. Humor was one of the ways in which they grappled with this situation. There were clowns in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were people who began to use satire as a modality. And remember, you have to grapple with that in a very particular way. The second taboo that has gone over now is a transformation, most especially in women's studies, in which they are talking about the paradox of the multiple paradox of sexuality. Women's studies have gone in a couple of directions over the years, uh, the first generation tried to prove some feminist theory by virtue of teaching the Holocaust. And the second generation tries to use feminist theory in order to understand the Holocaust better. And the scholarship of the younger women is now extraordinary. But they're grappling with the combination of sexual exploitation that took place, oftentimes that took place both on the part of the Nazis who faced a taboo if they had relations with Jewish women, um, in particular because they were violating uh, the rules that were established at Nuremberg. But if they had relations, there was all sorts of sexual exploitation, but we've also seen something else. We've also seen the counter testimony of deep love that has developed because of the people who had only today and not tomorrow. And when you all have only today and not tomorrow, some bonds were established that were enormously intense. And where the two survived, it lasted a lifetime. Let me tell one story so you'll get an illustration of that. It's a story that I've heard directly from a survivor. A man by the name of Ben and Vlad Gamid, they saw each other. How did they become boyfriend and girlfriend? 
It's a wonderful story. Vladka was working for the underground and she was going to be sent on a mission. She said to the boy that she had an interest in, the man, young man he had an interest in, she said, I'm going somewhere. My mother is dead. My father is dead. My brother is dead. Nobody cares for me. I'm going somewhere. I'm not sure I can return. If I don't return, I want you to miss me. You can be my boyfriend. Think of that bond. They later a boyfriend, girlfriend. Ben comes from a very religious family. His mother sees that he's staying out all night. She takes off her wedding ring. She says, give it to Vladka. His name was Feigl at that point, her nom de guru was Vladka, and put it on her ringer, on her, her ring, finger, lifts up a cup and says, Zoltan mit Mazel. They later were married by a rabbi, but they felt that that was what? That was the marriage. So we learn on the one hand of sexual exploitation, the other is we learn of the intense sense of what's involved at that point. We also have another area of scholarship that has been developed, which is a whole range of religious decisions that have come out, which you look at either from both a religious perspective or from the perspective of what we learn about history. Let's take a, a very simple example. You had a rabbi in the ghetto of um, Kovno, by then Rabbi Ephraim Oshri. He's asked a question. Do you put a mezuzah on your door if you're in the ghetto? Jewish law is very clear on that. I'm staying in a room. If I stay in a room or in a house for less than 30 days, I have no obligation to put a mezuzah on my door. But if the house is going to be a permanent dwelling place of 30 days or more, then you have an obligation to put a mezuzah on the door. Allah is clear, but the question, how do you answer the question? And what does that tell to your people in the ghetto? Do you want to tell them the ghetto is permanent? They may not take preparations to deal with the life in the ghetto. Or do you really want to tell them the situation is temporary and add to their anxiety, but also signal to them that this is a phase of something, but not a permanent reality? So the rabbi didn't have to answer the halakha question. He had to answer the most more difficult question, which is the question of what situation are you living in? And the answer to that changed over a very particular time. Clear? In the same way that the question then religiously, you're given 20,000 work permits, you have 60,000 people in the ghetto. Are you allowed to hand out the work permits? Are you allowed to compile the list for deportation. What's the difference between the two of them? And the interesting thing is that the law is very clear on this, which is if an enemy surrounds the city and asks you to give one person or they will destroy the entire city, you may not give up the one person. But if the enemy names the one person, Plony Almoni, then you may give over the one person and save the city. What is the difference between the two of them? In one case, you are deciding who shall live and who shall die. In another case, somebody else has made that decision. But the second issue becomes, are the 20,000 work permits life-saving for 20,000 people, or are they dooming for 40,000 others? 
and what do you do at that point? And from my mind, what has come out in the religious discussions has been something very, very important, which is that they tell us some struggle and some sense of how to live with integrity in a situation in which it is almost impossible to live and even more difficult to live with integrity, moral integrity or religious integrity. Let me touch on two other areas and then sum up. One of the other things that's come out recently has been a new area of work which is called Jews Saving Jews. Yad Vashem, to its enormous credit, has taught us a lot about non-Jews who save Jews. They named them the righteous among the nations of the earth, and my criticism of that is very slight. I'm not sure how many people strive to be righteous. I think many more strive to be decent. My mother's statement, be a mensch. So I think they've made the saving too exalted. But on the other hand, they emphasized non-Jews who saved Jews, but they didn't give us role models of Jews who saved Jews. And now understanding how you can act to save each other in a moment of difficulty becomes a whole area of scholarship, a whole area of learning, and a whole area of modeling what people can do. It is very important for, and I, I, I've dealt with this, for example, in Cincinnati in a museum to the Underground Railroad. It's very important to understand in the Underground Railroad the help that was offered by decent white people. It's absolutely essential to understand the courage of the black people who acted in solidarity with each other. In this history, what the Jews did and how they helped each other becomes very important. And also it becomes important to show us something else, which is that just because Jews were powerless does not mean they were passive. Let me repeat that. Just because Jews were powerless does not mean they were passive. Lastly, last question, lastly, Let's talk about one final thing. We had a mantra. You heard one part of the mantra, Zachor. And for many years, we were afraid how the Holocaust would be remembered, whether it would be remembered. Now we have to worry not whether it would be remembered, it's being remembered but we have to guard the nature of what's happening with that memory, that it's not trivialized, vulgarized, falsified. The other slogan we had was never again. But all of us have to now grapple with the idea that the Holocaust is taught where it's not the last genocide, but it's been followed by many other genocides that have taken place. And consequently, the question is, what does never again mean? I attended a conference at Yad Vashem in which they began to say, what does never again mean? After you've gotten to the idea that Jews learned from the Holocaust that powerlessness invites victimization, so part of the story of 20th century Judaism has been the empowerment of the Jewish people. And now that you have power, what do you want to achieve? And the second is the moral imperative. If it's never again, but we have again and again and again, not the Shoah, but other forms of genocide, we have to begin to understand that the Holocaust becomes the paradigm that is instructive. It teaches us that we cannot stand idly by, and the most that we can say, never again, not with my consent, not with my silence, not with my passivity, and not with my acceptance. And there's a wonderful Hasidic story with which I'll close. A Rebbe once taught 
sometimes you yell at the world to change the world, and sometimes you yell at the world to make sure the world doesn't change you. We have to continue yelling at this world. Yelling loud, yelling loud, yelling loud. And we have to exemplify the notion of compassion and justice. Thank you very much. My name is Pauline Rockman and as co-president of the Jewish Holocaust Center, it's my great pleasure and indeed honor to offer the vote of thanks for this evening's oration. I wish to thank you, Michael. You landed in Melbourne earlier today and you've presented us here this evening with an incredible analysis of the shifting themes in contemporary society with respect to the Holocaust, from hate, increase in hate crimes to the different scholarship to humour in the Holocaust and it's been a great privilege for us at the Holocaust Centre to be host to such an outstanding scholar. Um, you've contributed so much to the perpetuation of memory to our Kadoshim, the victims of the Nazis and their, hen and their henchmen. <clears throat> we go home this evening richer, richer in the knowledge you've imparted to us. Maybe not so happy because it was a bit of a reality test, but I reckon we'll continue yelling, and that's what we do at our work at the centre. And as you are well aware, such an event like this takes a lot of planning, and to be able to present an evening like this, and I want to thank all the dedicated members of the Jewish Holocaust Centre for organising this evening's commemoration, with a special mention of thanks to Michael Cohen, who's going to join me on the stage now, to all the volunteers and all of you for your invaluable assistance. And thank you all for coming here this evening. But there is one more part to the program, and I'll call on Michael. Thank you. At commemorations to mark the Holocaust, and at events such as Kristallnacht, anniversary of Kristallnacht, associated with the Holocaust, it's traditional to light six memorial candles, I invite Irma Hanna, a guide at the Jewish Holocaust Center, to light the first candle. Irma, a survivor of Theresienstadt, was a young child in Germany when the Kristallnacht pogrom took place. The candle she kindles is dedicated to the one and a half million infants, young children and youths whose lives were cut short in the Holocaust, but his memory endures. I invite Danny Rosencrantz, grandson of Betty and Shmuel Rosencrantz, to light a second candle, a candle dedicated to the courageous ghetto fighters and partisans, to those who raised the banner of resistance against all odds. Many of them sacrificed their lives so that others could live. I invite Michael Rose, a young Austrian intern who's dedicated a year of service to the Jewish Holocaust Center to kindle a light in honor of the Hasidei Umot Olam, those righteous among the nations who risked their lives in selfless attempts to save Jews during the Shoah. Abe Goldberg. Abe is a Holocaust survivor, guide, board member, and among the founders of the Jewish Holocaust Center. He was a lifelong friend of Shmuel Rosenkrantz, I invite Abe to light a candle to honor the precious survivors and to light a candle in gratitude to those who've dedicated themselves to keeping the flame of memory alive. And I invite Evan Lazarus, who enjoyed a deep and abiding relationship with Shmuel Rosencrantz, to dedicate a candle as a symbol of rebirth and as a symbol of regeneration, the rebirth of the State of Israel in the shadow of the Shoah and the re regeneration of Jewish life in its aftermath. And finally, David Burston. David is a guide at the Jewish Holocaust Center. He's also a lifelong friend of the Goldman Rosencrantz family. I invite David to dedicate a sixth and a final candle to serve as a perpetual memory of the victims of Sinat Chinam, of wanton, of baseless hatred. 
among them the 11 victims of the recent mass shooting in the Tree of Life Shaw, the Ors Lesimcha Shaw in Pittsburgh. Let this candle symbolize our pledge of never again, an affirmation to pursue the course of justice, justice for all, and to acknowledge the dignity of each and every human being. I ask you to stand as we sing together the Australian national anthem, Hatikfa, and I invite Rabbi Philip Helbrun to join me to sing with you and with me, with all of us together, the partisan song, a song written by Hirsch Glick in the Vilna Ghetto. And we have present today, of course, our precious Philip Maisel, Philip, who runs the Testimonies Department at the Jewish Holocaust Center and has for decades, and who was probably the first person together with his twin sister to hear the words of Zognit Kenmore. And it's a pleasure and a... Yes, and we're going to sing it, Philip. So please, Rabbi Helbron, would you join me? And we'll sing together all the anthems. Australians, all oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. We've golden soil and wealth for to home is good by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts, beauty rich and rare. In history's page, let every state advance Australia fair. In joyful strains, then let us sing advance Australia fair. Wir haben uns ein Lied von dort zu dort. 
nur auf Versalen wird das und war umgejohr. Wir haben Rose und gehen das Lied von dort zu dort. Das Lied geschrieben ist mit Blut und nicht mit Blei. Es ist nicht kein Lied von der Feigen auf der Frei. Das hat davon sie wischen fallen, die gewöhnt. Das Lied gesungen mit Naganes in die Hände. Das hat der Volk zu wischen fallen, die gewöhnt. Das Lied gesungen mit Naganes in die Hände. Du sagst nicht kein Mal, als du gehst dem letzten Weg. Hat Himmel bleien, verschleien bleue Tag. Kommen wollen auf unser uns gebänkte Schoß. Es wird abbeugt und unser Trott für seinen Do. Kommen wird noch unser uns gebänkte Schoß. Es wird abbeugt und unser Trott für seinen Do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.